Uh, so good afternoon, everyone. So today is our great pleasure to have uh, Dr. Yuyuan Ouyang to give us a uh, seminar talk. Uh, so Yuyuan now is an associate professor uh, to the School of Mathematical and Statistical Sciences uh, at Clemson University. So his research interest is mainly on uh, algorithm design and uh, complex analysis for solving larger scale nonlinear optimizing problems. Uh, and his research is supported by NSF and ONR. Uh, and today he's going to talk about uh, the universal conditional gradient sliding for convex optimization. So yeah, I'm giving you this control. All right, uh, thanks uh, Yang for the great introduction. It is uh, uh, really nice to be able to present uh, in your seminar. And uh, uh, my talk, let's go right into the the, 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 the details. So, uh, so the problem of interest we have uh, is the following. We're trying to minimize a function f of x, and uh, we have a physical set capital X. So it's uh, the, uh, the uh, pretty abstract description, and we're just gonna uh, think about uh, how to work on this uh, optimization problem. And uh, there, are, there are simple cases when we can talk about really, really quickly, uh, for example, the, well, uh, nonlinear optimization 101 or calculus. Basically, we know how it works. So, uh, the, the, the way we can do that, I just noticed that I, I can, excuse me, oops. Um, okay, so, uh, sorry, I think there was uh, something wrong. In my in my in my connection, um, so okay, uh, I was trying to connect uh, both uh, the the laptop in, uh, to to the meeting, and uh, may not be a great idea. But uh, uh, let me continue using the the, the iPad. So uh, if there is anything uh, anything wrong uh, or anything you would like to ask, uh, please feel free to just uh, speak because I uh, unfortunately we're not going to be able to see uh, your faces. So. Um, let me continue with uh, this uh, uh, problem. So, optimization 101, uh, we can just go the uh, grand descent if uh, the feasible set is just going to be Rn. So, what happens is that uh, what we're going to do is uh, uh, just go negative gradient direction for a certain step size, 1 over beta of k. Now, it is equivalent as... Uh, uh, minimize, uh, minimizing a balance between the uh, the uh, the linear approximation of the function at a certain point uh, and uh, the uh, pro proximity pre uh, with the previous uh, iteration. So, uh, in this talk, what we're going to focus on is uh, projection-free deterministic first-order methods for convex optimization. Uh, I still need to introduce what uh, pro projection free means, but uh, deterministic, deterministic means we're not going to do any randomness. There is no randomization in the, the in the method. We're going to talk about first order methods. That means we're only going to use gradient information. We're not going to use uh, uh, Newton or higher order information. And uh, for this problem, uh, if we think about the gradient descent and uh, based on our understanding about uh, balancing the linear approximation versus the proximity, uh, what we can do is that we can extend immediately for a general uh, physical set, capital X, just change the Rn in the previous formulation to X. Then what we have over here is essentially we do gradient descent and then we project to the physical set. And uh, in each iteration, what we do is uh, we do a projection and then uh, we're just gonna uh, we're just gonna project uh, to the feasible set capital X. Uh, this is not necessarily uh, a, a computationally easy process because we need to compute the projection, and for relatively complicated capital X, we might require high computation effort. Uh, we can actually take a look at the projection-based method in a very simple example. So take a look at this problem. We are actually looking at uh, a minimization of a smooth, actually also strongly convex function. Uh, we minimize it over a polytope. In our case, it's actually a line segment. It's a, a, a very simple uh, two-dimensional simplex. 
So the optimal solution is in the middle of the line segment. Uh, what we're going to do is that we're going to start at the top left at zero one. So projected gradient descent, uh, what we have is that we're going to set a step, set a step size to be one half. So uh, at any point when we compute the gradient, the gradient is the direction going toward the origin, and we take one half of the gradient. So for each iteration, we go uh, one half. Uh, yeah, we, we go half the gradient. Uh, to 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 a position, and then we project back to the physical set, and then we compute the gradient. So go one half of the gradients, and then project, and then go and project. So this is uh, what happens when we do projection based method. So uh, this is for a very simple polytope, and for general polytope uh, in high dimension, uh, we know obviously that uh, projection to a high dimensional general polytope is not naturally uh, easy to compute. So we might require a relatively high computational effort if we want to talk about general cases. But, that, but uh, nonetheless, we can see the iterations of the projection-based method. Now, let's take a look at uh, the other kind of, uh, of method in which if we're going to worry about the high computation cost of a projection-based method. So what happens over here is that uh, let's take a look at the projection-based method and try to take a look at uh, which part is time consuming. And uh, over here, obviously the case is uh, that uh, this norm squared and the associated projection is the time, uh, is the, the computation, computational uh, more expensive uh, uh, part. So a very naive idea we can think about uh, immediately is the following. So what happens uh, is that uh, we can just uh, think about, uh, well, uh, take remove uh, this uh, this uh, norm squared part and just work on the minimization of the linear approximation part of the problem. Just look at it over here. All right. So uh, for this case, what happens is that in each equation, we we're not doing compu uh, the computation of the projection. Rather, we are computing a linear objective optimization subproblem over the feasible set capital X. Of course, we might need some um, assumptions to make sure that this linear, linear optimization problem has a solution. For example, we need to require that uh, the feasible set capital X is compact. Uh, now, if we take a look at uh, the projection-free method over here and uh, try to take a look at uh, its uh, performance in this very simple example, what's going to happen? So we are minimizing over a polytope. Again, uh, we know what the optimal solution is. We start from the top left over here, top left over here. And then what happens is that uh, because it's uh, linear, okay, at uh, each iteration at the beginning, you go the gradient direction, which is over here. And therefore the optimal solution you have is gonna be the other end of this extreme point. And then you compute uh, the gradient one more time, which is in this direction. So the next solution of this linear approximation, you're going to end up at one of the other extreme point, which means if we use the naive idea, what's, what we're going to end up is we're just going to oscillating between the, uh, the, the extreme points, the two different extreme points, all right? So that's what's going to happen. So we're going to end up oscillating between those two. So this is not going to work. It's not going to converge. But uh, the conditional gradient method or uh, Frank Wolf method uh, is uh, it's basically a combination of this naive idea with uh, an averaging process. So what happens over here is that we know the naive idea is going to fail. It's going to minimize the linear approximation, and it might oscillate between extreme points. Instead, what we can do is that in addition to the original idea, we add an averaging uh, part to this iteration. So this is going to be a weighted average that the, the weights depends on the parameter gamma over here. Uh, this gamma is going to be between zero and one. And uh, the output we have is a convex combination of all the previous iterates, all right? Uh, the simplest case, of course, is when yk is just the simple average of the previous iterates through x1 through xk. If we take a look at uh, the uh, the simple uh, example, what happens is that uh, this time, because of the weight, uh, what happens is that we're still going to start from top left. At the beginning, we're going to go to the other extreme point. And uh, because of the weight, uh, the weight we choose over here, this gamma k, let's choose it to be, say, 
2 over k plus 1, in which case uh, the first output of y1 is going to be over here because the weight is going to be 0 for this point, 1 for this point. So we're going to end up over here. And the next uh, step, uh, the, the solution is going to be over here. Uh, but taking the average because of the weight, we're going to end up over here. So, so we go from here, we, uh, then we go to the other end. And because of the average in next step, although we go to extreme points, average gets us over here. And next, because average, we go over here and we go, go, uh, go forward like this. Okay, so this is uh, the performance in our example. So if you put uh, both of them together, what's going to happen over here is uh, very interesting. The projection-based method and projection-free method of performance, we can already see something uh, interesting over here. The projection-based method, we know that it converges faster because if you take a look at it, it's just going to converge to the optimal solution directly. And uh, well, of course, we need to solve a projection problem. If this is easy to solve, good. If this is not easy to solve, well, we are worried about worrying about the computational effort. Uh, the other case, the projection three, well, convergence is kind of slower because it has this kind of zigzag kind of uh, performance. And uh, uh, the the benefit, of course, is that it's not solving a projection. Instead, it's solving a linear. Uh, objective uh, subplot, which might be cheaper to compute. So, so there is this kind of trade-off between the uh, the convergence and uh, the projection uh, computation. So, uh, this is uh, the, the the simple introduction about uh, what uh, we are considering. Uh, can we do more over here as soon as we understand the, the projection based and projection free method? Well, quick questions we can ask uh, immediately is how fast can we converge? Can we converge faster? And uh, for our case of uh, convex F, we might also be interested at how the convergence depends on the smoothness, the level of smoothness of L uh, of F. Uh, so those are the things that we're interested at. For projection-based method, all the questions uh, I've, I've, we've just asked uh, are actually well studied. So, so we know everything about the questions. Uh, we know about projected gradient method, and we know that this is not uh, in a, a optimal method. Uh, I think there is a typo. This should be Z of K, sorry. Uh, so there is this known method, uh, accelerated gradient method by Nastrov, in which what happens is, uh, well, based on our understanding, uh, each step of projected gradient method were balancing linear approximation and the proximity to the previous iterate. Now, for this linear approximation, well, it does not necessarily have to be linear approximation at uh, the previous iterate, xk minus 1. So we can change it to a different point, uh, zk, uh, for both uh, those, uh, those two places, in which zk is the convex combination of previous iterates. So if you do this, it can be proved uh, that uh, the convergence is going to be faster. If you take a look at the Nastrov's method over here, in each iteration, we need uh, one projection, which is over here. We need the one gradient evaluation, which is over here. So that's uh, the, the projection-based method we are encountering over here. Uh, we know very well about its performance, and uh, we know that in order to compute an epsilon solution, the number of iterations it takes is in the order of uh, one over square root of epsilon. It also depends on the Lipschitz constant L of the gradient of the objective function. Uh, we also know that this convergence, uh, uh, the result, the rate of convergence, its order cannot be improved. The reason why it cannot be improved is because uh, there exists already worst case uh, uh, problems in which all first order methods cannot perform better than this result. So this we know cannot be improved. Oh, about Nestor's the accelerated gradient method, we know the performance. We know that uh, the uh, convexity is in an order of one number square root of epsilon, and we also know that convergence is not uh, improvable. Now, uh, what we're interested in at, uh, is that we would like to know the uh, the complexity, uh, the convergence property with respect to different levels of smoothness. Here, let me try to uh, mention uh, define what we mean by levels of smoothness. Over here, what happens is that uh, uh, we're going to assume that the gradient is going to be a uh, holder continuous uh, with the exponent nu and a constant m sub nu. So we know that uh, the, the simple case when nu is equal to 0 or nu equal to 1 is actually clear because uh, nu equal to 1 
we have a one over here and we have a Lipschitz uh, continuous uh, gradient. And if nu is equal to zero, uh, by some uh, convex analysis, well, this term is gone. By some convex analysis, we can actually easily see that uh, uh, this covers the non-differentiable case. Of course, because it's non-differentiable, we're going to have to replace the gradient by subgradient. But um, uh, but uh, this definition of a uh, uh, holder continuity covers the non-differentiable case uh, as well, as long as the function f itself is uh, Lipschitz continuous. Uh, so the question is, uh, what is going to be the convergence property with respect to different levels of smoothness or different choice of uh, this uh, new and m sub new? For projection-based method, this is again well studied. Uh, we can look at accelerate group method one more time, and we know that uh, for a general new, the number of iterations in order to compute an approximate solution is in this order. So this number might uh, look a little bit sophisticated, but uh, we can take a look at special cases to easily understand what's going on. So new equal to one, we plug in one, we have a two over four over here. So we have a one over square root of each one dependence. If we ignore the, 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 the uh, dx part over here, this is the diameter of the physical set. If we focus on the dependence of the constants and each one, this is the order. Now, if nu is equal to zero, plug in, I get a two in, in the exponent. So I have a epsilon squared, and there is also supposed to be a square, sorry, uh, dependence. Uh, I need to mention over here that there, this actually reveals a significant difference between smooth and, uh, and uh, non-smooth optimization. The thing is that if you think about uh, epsilon in the order of, say, 0 0.01, then smooth case, we need in the order of 10 iterations to get an approximate solution. For non-smooth case, we need in the order of 10,000 to get uh, approximate solution. And then uh, for different choice of new between zero and one, this actually reveals uh, how the complexity is gonna change. We also know that this result is not improvable. This is uh, based on Namrowski's uh, lower complexity bound result. And uh, for any kind of new, there always is uh, this kind of function such that a first order method performance cannot be better than this one. So this result we know cannot be improved. Now, what happens if we go to the projection based, uh, sorry, instead of projection based method, projection free method, uh, still worry about uh, the level of smoothness. So this is the result we know regarding Frank Wolf or conditional gradient method. Uh, we're gonna use Frank Wolf and conditional gradient method interchangeably over uh, our talk. And uh, for, for this problem, just reminding ourselves, in each iteration, we need to compute one gradient, and we need to minimize a linear objective function over, over the feasible set. So the current known result is going to be the following. The number of iterations in order to compute an internal solution for a general holder continuous gradient is in this order. Now we can, again, look at special cases. Uh, the case when nu is equal to 1, uh, Plug in one here, I get an order of one over epsilon squared. This is already worse than previous case because uh, previous case was one over square root of epsilon. Uh, currently, there is no universal results that covers all the new between zero and one. The previous two results in Maskerov and Gardini uh, requires new to be between zero and one, but zero is not included. And uh, we are not, not uh, certain whether or not the results can be improved. Uh, based on the uh, those two previous ones. Those two previous ones basically tells us what could be done, but we don't know what the performance limit is. So there is one more algorithm that's uh, worth mentioning uh, because it's, uh, it's uh, closely related to our, our result, is the conditional gradient sliding method by Lan and Cho. Uh, the problem of interest is going to be the same, but they only consider the case when the gradient of F is Lipschitz. The idea of conditional gradient sliding is a combination of uh, accelerated gradient method, the projection-based method, and uh, the conditional gradient method in the inner iteration. Essentially, what happens over here is that for each iteration, for each iteration, it tries to approximately solve a projection problem. So if you are plug in the gradient, the x, uh, the, the, the choice of beta and eta over here to this function, uh, for accelerated gradient method, each iteration you try to solve this problem exactly. 
And the conditional gradient sliding tries to solve uh, this projection problem approximately using conditional gradient method. So what, what's very interesting over here for this method is that uh, the conditional gradient sliding method is essentially a combination of the two ideas of uh, accelerated gradient and uh, the conditional gradient method. And uh, what happens is that it's not going to solve the project, uh, projection problem exactly. Rather, it's going to solve it approximately with an error threshold, uh, accuracy or accuracy threshold at a k. So it's going to approximately solve a projection problem in each equation. And uh, for the, the, the nice thing for this algorithm is because that if you take a look at it and try to think how many uh, gradient uh, evaluations and how many linear objective uh, iterations it does, those two are not necessarily the same throughout the algorithm. For the iterations uh, uh, in the outer, one iteration I compute a gradient. So the total number of gradient evaluation depends on the current number of outer iteration, t, uh, k. The inner, well, it runs a number of iterations, uh, tk iterations of conditional gradient method to solve the projection problem. And therefore, the total number of uh, the linear optimization it has to solve is in the order of the sum of all the inner iterations. So those two numbers are not necessarily the same if this tk is not equal to one. And uh, because uh, this number is at least going to be one, we know that we're going to solve more linear objective subproblems than gradient evaluations. So if we if we think about uh, what's what's going on over here, uh, there are two perspectives. If we take a look at uh, what, what 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 we're looking, so we can either understood it as we are taking more linear objective subproblems than gradient evaluations, or we can equivalently understand it as uh, for the same number of linear objective subproblems, we skip computation of certain gradients. So in this sense, uh, the conditional gradient sliding requires less number of gradient evaluations in order to compute epsilon solution. So if we take a look at uh, the comparison of all those results, what happens is that uh, there is uh, this very nice uh, uh, the result by conditional gradient uh, sliding. The accelerated gradient method is in this order for the, uh, the, the uh, convexity. The conditional gradient is in this order. The, let's take a look at a case when nu is equal to one. When nu is equal to one, which the conditional gradient ma sliding method studies, the, the order of gradient evaluation matches the accelerated gradient method, the one that converges faster. And the number of linear objective subproms, it matches uh, the conditional gradient method, the one that converges relatively slow, but uh, per iteration cost is cheaper. So conditional gradient method actually achieves uh, uh, a, a, a faster convergence in terms of gradient evaluation, and at the same time maintains relatively cheaper uh, uh, linear objective subproms. So this is the benefit of this, uh, this problem. Uh, but it, it does not uh, it does not cover all the cases of uh, holder continuous functions. But uh, by the virtue of its achievements, we can naturally think about a research question, and this is the naive question we ask at the beginning of our research. So we know conditional gradient sliding has this little trick, so that uh, it it could uh, have a less number of gradient evaluations that matches uh, the projected uh, projection based method, and. Uh, it takes more uh, projection-free uh, uh, problems, the linear objective ones, that uh, uh, is less expensive to compute. So if we try to combine the idea of all the above, uh, is it possible for, us, for the holder case to have uh, the number of gradient, gradient evaluation equal to projection-based method, the, the, the less number, uh, the, the faster convergence, and uh, we take the cheaper linear objective subproms whose performance matches conditional gradient. So this is the naive research question we have. Let's take a look at uh, what's happening, okay? Uh, we are just gonna study the conditional gradient sliding method uh, that we mentioned previously, which has this uh, very interesting problem. And we consider the analysis of this already uh, listed algorithm, already available algorithm, 
just to look at the, the, the analysis for the holder case and see how it goes. All right, let's try to do a little bit of analysis. Uh, it's uh, great that we are in the seminar, uh, a math department, so I suppose I can do a little bit of proof. I'm going to do a little bit of uh, uh, technical de de details by listing a, a result of our analysis. Uh, for this result, uh, what happens is that uh, we can just take a look at it and notice that we can start taking a sum uh, from, from K equal to 1 to, to, for example, capital K to a certain number. And uh, very interesting over here is that there is this XK minus 1 term and XK term, and there is a plus, there is a minus. So we have a potential uh, possibility, uh, uh, we have a possibility of canceling plus and negative signs if the parameters are chosen properly. All right. Let's take a look at uh, the, the, the analysis for con the continuous gradient sliding, and let's focus on this outer iteration. This is our result. Uh, and if we move on to the inner iteration, we need to take a look at uh, uh, one very interesting feature of uh, the proposed uh, uh, algorithm uh, by uh, Lan and Zhou. So they have outer, which is, uh, uh, in some sense, resembles projection-based methods. They have inner iteration, which is a uh, number of iterations of conditional gradient method. And uh, they are going to compute approximate solution. So, so uh, they, their accuracy threshold is going to be at k. So what happens is that we know that uh, if the inner problem is, uh, is uh, this problem, this is the projection, because of the norm squared, and the projection does not appear over here, then the conditional gradient sliding reduces to conditional gradient. Also, the same, the same understanding is that uh, if uh, the inner iteration, the conditional gradient method, we only perform one iteration, TK is always going to be one, what's going to happen? In each iteration, we compute one gradient, and we perform one iteration of conditional gradient method, which is one linear optimization subproblem, then that is the same as uh, the conditional gradient, because gradient, conditional gradient does exactly one gradient evaluation and one linear objective optimization in each iteration. So, so if, uh, if, even if we are solving a projection problem approximately, if the inner iteration is always going to be one, we reduce to conditional gradient method. Of course, it could also reduce to uh, the projection-based method, accelerated projected uh, gradient, if we run, for example, infinite number of iterations to make sure that uh, there is no error. The error is always zero. Uh, but that's not our consideration. We're really interested to add its relationship to conditional gradient method. What's, what's so interesting over here is because uh, in their analysis, they proved uh, how the, the, the convergence rate for their inner conditional gradient iterations. In other words, if the arrow you choose is large enough, is large enough, as large as this numerator, then you only need one iteration to compute an approximate solution of uh, this uh, threshold. And uh, then the algorithm reduces to conditional gradient method. And therefore, if we do analysis of conditional gradient method, we can use the analysis to cover the analysis of a conditional gradient method itself. Okay, so uh, the analysis of conditional gradient sliding actually covers conditional gradient itself. So this is just a list of, uh, of uh, the theorem. And uh, for a certain choice of parameters, we are able to get this convergence result and this complexity. We can uh, go through it relatively quickly and notice that this is the same complexity as the conditional gradient algorithm analysis previously. So we, we recover the previous conditional gradient algorithm. But let's pause a little bit, uh, because there, even if we take a look at this really briefly, there is going to be something that's going to catch our eye. Just take a look at uh, one of the line over here. Okay, there is going to be one line that catches our eye. I'm going to highlight it over here in red. So what's very interesting over here is that in this analysis, somehow I see something, uh, well, in our mind, may not be perfect. Why? The reason is because dx squared is the diameter of the feasible set. And this, well, if I try to look at uh, the, the value of uh, the, the norm distance for any xk minus 1 and x in the feasible set, this norm squared is also going to be bounded by a constant times the diameter 
squared. So the terms over here, if I take a look at uh, dx squared and take a look at this difference, somehow it's not balanced enough. There is some imperfection over here. The reason is because this term is always going to be the dominant term. No matter what kind of cancellation I'm trying to do with uh, the, the remaining two terms. Even I try to cancel the plus uh, k minus one term minus k term. Whatever I do, this is always dominant. Dx squared is always going to be dominant. And even if I choose the best possible, the better parameter I can possibly choose by minimizing the right hand side, uh, the choice is always going to recover the previous uh, convergence uh, properties of conditional gradient method. So there is no way for us to improve if uh, the, the error of the inner problem is in this order. And if we only equivalently, if we only run one inter inner iteration, or e equivalently, if we take a look at the conditional gradient method itself. They, the, what, what this tells us is that we should actually change the, the accuracy threshold for the inner problem. We try to reduce it uh, to make sure that uh, the, the terms could balance better. So instead of uh, choosing the, 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 the choice equal to this value, which gives us conditional gradient method, we should actually choose a much smaller one. So for each equation, it should be much smaller. It should, uh, it should uh, have a denominator k over here, so it's, it's smaller. And if I choose it is smaller, then our convergence results, the number of gradient evaluations and the number of linear objectives, uh, subproms, is going to be different. Uh, interestingly, if we go back to our original naive research question, our question is, can we compute uh, gradient evaluations that's going to match the previous pre uh, projection-based method, which is this order, and we actually get exactly this order. If we take a look at uh, the linear objective subproblem order that we're trying to achieve, which is over here, well, our result is not one over new like the previous results in the literature. Just uh, by, by changing the parameter, our result actually has a different component, uh, has a different exponent in the previous one. And uh, our result is actually unexpectedly better. So this is uh, something that uh, uh, we have not uh, discovered before. This is actually something that did not appear in uh, sliding-based algorithms before, including conditional gradient sliding method. Uh, we have not yet seen a sliding method that is able to improve both gradient evaluation and uh, overall uh, complexity. And uh, interestingly, uh, this is improved. The reason is because uh, if nu is, say, one over three, then our result is in the order of one over each one squared. The previous result is in the order of one over each one cubed. So our result is actually better. And this is very interesting. It's done by just observing what the analysis of conditional gradient sliding is for holder uh, continuous, continuous gradient, and we can achieve this result. So if you take a look at what we have right now, uh, we know projection-based method has uh, requires less gradient evaluations, and uh, uh, the continuous gradient method requires more. Uh, and we know gradient sliding performs really well for nu equal to one. Our result actually interestingly improves uh, uh, upon the conditional gradient method over here. We can improve uh, both the exponent for gradient complexity and the exponent for linear sub from complexity. So this is something that's unexpected and very interesting. Uh, the idea, well, we are actually doing conditional gradient sliding. So we also skip uh, gradient evaluations from time to time. Our result obviously matches uh, the conditional gradient sliding for the new equal to one case. And uh, uh, one more nice thing about uh, our result is that our complexity analysis, if we take a look at over here, and comparing it with the previous result. Previous result could not require nu to be zero. The reason is because nu equal to zero, I have one over zero. Our result actually in the complexity allows nu equal to zero. Actually, our analysis uh, could allow nu equal to zero as well. So our result actually uh, 
covers all the cases when nu is between zero and one, zero and one included. So those are uh, nice results that we have. If we take a look at uh, uh, our current uh, 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 theoretical analysis, our current theoretical analysis, uh, uh, we are going to set parameters depending on the knowledge of the holder constant. So next question is, uh, can we design a method that, that does not require this knowledge? We've, that would make the algorithm obviously. So can we do this? Uh, well, we know this can be done. This has been done already previously for uh, holder continuous uh, 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 gradients. We know there is this so-called universal gradient uh, uh, method. This is the universal gradient version of uh, natural accelerated gradient method that does not require this knowledge. Uh, the parameter setting over in in natural 2015 paper, however, uh, does not apply immediately to our algorithm. The key difference is because natural uh, method uh, in 2015 is a gradient method, and method does uh, do projection. Uh, instead, it does uh, uh, does linear. Uh, subplots. So the parameters uh, that was used in Nastrov's paper, unfortunately, does not apply. Um, but uh, the idea, we can adapt the idea of uh, Nastrov's paper uh, to uh, to perform a more practical implementation. So the key thing I want to point out in our practical implementation version of the algorithm is the following. Uh, we have a very interesting parameter setting ourselves. Uh, this one, as far as I know, is not the usual choice uh, in the literature. Um, I don't remember seeing this choice of parameters in the previous literature. So, uh, in the first glance of this algorithm, it actually resembles uh, the previous uh, accelerated gradient method with line search. But we have a relatively special setting of parameters. Usual setting is uh, is this without a k in the denominator? Our setting has a k in the denominator. So, so just a little tweak of the parameters, we are already able to adapt uh, adopt the the previous line search uh, accelerated gradient method to do a practical implementation. Uh, this is our inner problem in which we use conditional gradient method. Uh, we also add uh, a little bit tweak that we allow this the linear subproblem. To be solved approximately as well. Uh, our final result, well, uh, luckily, still does not change the complexity. It's going to be the same order of complexity. So, the the final result. This is our parameter setting. Over here, the the arrow sub k, gamma sub k, those are adapted. We can, uh, we don't need to know them, and they are going to be adapted in our algorithm. Uh, the only things we're going to require is uh, the accuracy, accuracy threshold. Basically, you need to tell me uh, what kind of accuracy you are looking for, this epsilon. Uh, there is also this approximation constant. This approximation constant, basically, you just need to try to tell me what kind of uh, approximate, approximate solution you are trying to use in the inner uh, problem. And this can be actually chosen as any number. Uh, you also need to tell me the diameter of the feasible set. As long as uh, you can provide those, and in which this constant uh, uh, sigma uh, does not, uh, it can be, for example, just one. Uh, and uh, this, you would like that anyways, because uh, if you want an approximate solution, you would like to know what the accuracy threshold is. So the only necessary uh, constant we need is uh, the diameter. And uh, other than that, we don't need anything. We don't need any knowledge on the holder constants, and this algorithm is going to try to adapt and try to, to adapt to the best uh, constants itself. Uh, it has the accuracy certific certificate, that is to say, if this is satisfied, this uh, approximate solution uh, condition is satisfied, it's going gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna to terminate. And uh, the complexity level is the same as uh, the previous uh, result uh, we talked about. Uh, the one that requires uh, the knowledge of constant. So some numerical results we have over here. Uh, the first numerical result we what we run is that we did uh, a non-smooth optimization and a minimizing a norm over a uh, convex hull. 
So there is a convex hall over here. So this is a general convex hall in which we will try to do projection. It's going to be time consuming uh, to do the projection in itself. And we compare with conditional gradient method. What happens is that the number of linear uh, the linear uh, optimization of linear objective subprom we do is going to be much more than the number of uh, conditional gradient uh, method. The reason is because uh, well we 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 compute less number of gradients. We compute a more number of linear subproms, and uh, conditional gradient uh, runs uh, the same number of gradients and the linear subproms in each iteration. So, so if the gradient evaluation is more expensive, we by skipping some gradients, we can actually have better uh, performance. So the time and the error for achieving an approximate solution, we're going to terminate when the accuracy threshold is ten to the negative five, and we're going to stop. Conditional gradients uh, run. Double the time, the, the more than hours is still not going to reach that that error. So this is uh, the first numerical result. And second numerical result, uh, we did uh, a problem in which we minimize the sum of two norm difference, uh, in which the feasible set is a spectrohedron. Uh, same same idea. The error our algorithm is going to stop when the accuracy threshold of ten to the negative five is satisfied. And we run double the time for conditional gradient uh, than ours, and uh, conditional gradient is not going to perform as uh, well as uh, our proposed method. And uh, so that's the numerical results. Let's summarize uh, what we have. Uh, so, so we have, uh, in addition to the previous uh, results, uh, uh, comparing to conditional gradient, in which reduce both the number of gradient evaluations and the number of linear subproms needed. Uh, we only require uh, the uh, epsilon, uh, the accuracy threshold, a constant sigma, which can be chosen as one, and the diameter of the feasible set for our practical computation. So this is our summary of our result. And uh, well, we might still want more. The reason why I'm, 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 I'm showing this slide is because of the following reason. We know a lower bound of this gradient uh, convexity. We know this cannot be improved. For any algorithm, uh, this cannot be improved. However, for this one, there is no lower bound. So, so originally, well, there was this performance. Our method successfully improves the performance to this one. Let's take the case when nu is equal to zero. Nu is equal to zero. This is going to be infinity. This is not going to cover nu equal to zero. For our case, nu equal to zero, the non-smooth case, our convexity is going to be in the order of epsilon to the four when when we have non-smooth uh, problem and the objective is Lipschitz. It's epsilon one over epsilon to the four. But there is already available method that is only on the non-smooth case, nu equal to zero, and this can already be improved for the non-smooth case. It is, it is in the order of actually uh, one over epsilon squared. So if we want more, there is still actually room to, uh, to improve it. One of the ongoing work that we are doing now is that we are actually trying to, to prove a result in which uh, the linear subproblem complexity is actually improved more from our previous result. We are actually trying to improve it to, to this number. So there is still room for improvements and uh, um, hopefully I can talk about this in the uh, in the future. So that's uh, the uh, end of my talk and uh, our paper is uh, available online. So if you have any question, uh, feel free to ask me or feel free to send me email. Thanks a lot, y'all. Okay, thanks a lot for this uh, nice talk. Uh, very nice results.